uh, please turn with me to Psalm 2. Psalm 2, if, you, if you'd like to use one of the Bibles in the racks there in the chairs in front of you, uh, Psalm 2 can be found on page 448. And uh, you wouldn't know it, but yesterday, with what, what we saw yesterday morning, but uh, spring is officially here. Wasn't that amazing yesterday, the snowfall, and uh, it was great that it lasted only for a short time. It was beautiful, but also alarming. Uh, but spring is here, theoretically. And with that, just around the corner, as I shared earlier this morning, in just two weeks, we will be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Easter Sunday is just two weeks away. And with that in mind, what we're going to do for the next several weeks is take a look at nine different psalms uh, that point to Jesus. These would be considered messianic psalms. Today we're going to look into Psalm 2, where the world is going to receive the instruction to give our allegiance to the Anointed One. In Psalm 8, uh, we'll see that the Son of Man was made lower than the angels and crowned with glory and honor. At our Good Friday service... That evening, we'll look at Psalm 22 and read the psalm that begins with the line, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At which would, Jesus would later cry out, of course, from the cross. On Easter Sunday, uh, we'll look at Psalm 16, the prophecy that God would not abandon his Holy One uh, in the grave or let him see corruption there in the tomb uh, because Jesus was going to rise from the dead. After that, for the next five weeks after Easter, we'll dig into Psalm 34, 45, 69, 110, and 118. And in those psalms, we'll see prophecies about Jesus' life and ministry, his suffering on the cross, his eternal priesthood, prophecies concerning his never-ending reign as king, and more. So I'm excited to spend uh, these next several weeks looking into these Old Testament Hebrew songs. Uh, these poems, most of them written by King David, uh, but all of them the inspired word of God. In order, we're going to read through these and study through these, preach through these in order to look, uh, to fix the eyes of our hearts on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Okay, so now, uh, before we start into Psalm 2, let's take a quick look at what comes before it. Uh, Many people tie Psalm 1 and 2 together. Uh, the idea being that when all the psalms were assembled, when, the, when it was edited into the order that we find them in, these psalms were put back to back at the beginning of all 150 psalms for a reason. So let me read to you all six verses of Psalm 1 as we get started. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff, that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Okay, so in this first psalm, we have a contrast of the man who is blessed and the wicked. The blessed man delights in the law of the Lord, in the word of God. He reads it, seeks to obey it, to follow the Lord's instruction, The wicked is not so. He does not delight in the law of the Lord. And in his lack of reverence for God and his word, uh, the wicked becomes uh, also a stumbling block, offering unbiblical counsel, offering ungodly ways, ungodly company, even to the righteous. Uh, The righteous has to stay rooted in the good ground, the good soil of the word of God in order to refrain from the snares of the wicked. And then, what are the results? Uh, The results of the ways of the righteous and the wicked. Uh, Those who trust in the Lord, who delight in his word and follow his ways, they are nourished, they are fruitful, and they prosper in wisdom. Uh, That's not a promise of wealth there in that verse, understand. Uh, Not necessarily that kind of prospering, 
but a prospering of wisdom that leads to a joyful, fulfilling life. That's the result of those who follow the Lord. And then what about the wicked? In contrast to the firmly rooted tree, readily watered by a flowing stream, the wicked are like chaff that the blow, it just blows away in that gust of wind. The wicked will not be able to stand in the judgment. They will be uh, rightly found guilty and sentenced. So we can say they, they will not stand in the congregation of the righteous, those whom God has declared righteous through the blood of Christ. The wicked won't remain together with us. Their judgment is coming and they will be expelled. And we know ultimately that means the judgment of eternal hell. That last line of Psalm 1 declares, the way of the wicked will perish. So knowing this, uh, knowing the contrast of the ways and the outcomes of following after the Lord on the one hand and rejecting him on the other, uh, knowing these two things, Psalm 2 begins with this question. Look at verse 1, Psalm 2. We could even put a so at the beginning. So, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The, the word translated as rage refers to an unrest, a rebellion. And the nations being from every people group under the earth or all over the earth, struggling against God. It says they are plotting in vain. In vain because if they fight against God, they are going to fail, right? This is a guaranteed losing battle for them. Verse two, the kings of the earth set themselves, uh, they're united together, they, they're ready to take their stand, and the rulers, it says, take counsel together. They collaborate together against the Lord. And in your Bible, you might see this written, the Lord, written in all caps, uh, signifying in the Hebrew, this is the name of the Lord. We might say it as Yahweh, sometimes it's said as Jehovah. This is the revealed name of God. And so the kings of the earth have gathered themselves up, they've strategized uh, together to battle against the Lord, the God who created the universe by the power of his word. And it says, also against his anointed, his anointed. In the Hebrew here, this is the word we say in English, Messiah. The Hebrew word for anointed, the anointed is Messiah. It sounds like Messiah. So, so just before we go any further, do you see a shift here in scenery from what we saw in Psalm 1 to Psalm 2? Make sure we have our heads in the right arena here. In Psalm 1, it might have felt pretty down to earth, uh, down here in the horizontal, just, just people trying to follow God, people who weren't, and streams of water, and trees, and chaff, and wind, and that kind of a setting, right? But now in Psalm 2, that chaff and the wind picture, it just got intense. Stuff just got real there. Uh, the things got vertical, and it's, it's no longer just random people who aren't following God, it's the powerful, the rulers, the kings of the nations, and they are readying, readying themselves to attack the Lord. Their wickedness isn't passive. Their wickedness isn't neutral. In fact, wickedness never is. And in this psalm, uh, we now see battle lines being drawn, and God Almighty is being challenged. So the final word of verse two is saying. These rulers and kings of the nations preparing to fight against God, are saying, verse three, let us burst there, and that there being the Lord's and his anointed's, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Uh, the idea here being, the kings and rulers of the earth, they see God's rule over them as a bondage. God's rule over them is bondage. They feel trapped by the Lord, and they want out from under his authority. Uh, with that, we think back to Psalm 1. The blessed man delights in the law of the Lord. The wicked feel trapped by it. 
Uh, We read God's word and we learn that he is our righteous creator and rightful Lord and master. We learn that we are sinners. We learn that God is loving and gracious and merciful. uh, And he proactively loved us by sending his anointed, sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross in our place for our rescue, for our salvation. The blessed read and learn all these things and by God's grace we cry out to God for salvation through the shed blood of Christ, and he gives it to us, right? And then, with a new heart and new purpose, we then delight in learning how to please him, to serve him, to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. But, that's the righteous, but the wicked, the wicked read the word of God, and they see things like, you can't have any other gods before me. And that includes yourself. Uh, You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You hear what I'm doing there? Going through the Ten Commandments. Or, Or commands like, do not be drunk with wine. Instruction like, the love of money is the root of all evil. That sex is for one man and one woman together in marriage. That life begins at conception, and the baby in the womb of its mother is to be protected as much as any other life. The wicked hear these things from God's word, and instead of being humbled, instead of being brought to their knees in repentance, instead of crying out to Christ for rescue and grace and forgiveness and eternal life and joy and freedom, which they could all have, Instead, they say, stop restricting me. You cannot tell me what I can and cannot do. I will not submit to you. I will go my own way. I am my own master. And realize, they're not saying that to the church. We're not any better than anybody else. They're saying it to God. Does that make sense? Not realizing In making this decision, they are willfully choosing to remain slaves to their sin. Willfully choosing to reject their only hope of rescue. Willfully choosing, then, therefore, death and hell. Christians, uh, with that being said, it is important that we stay humble here. If it were not for the grace of God, we would still be on that same track. And it took someone, or maybe several people over time, to faithfully share the truth of the gospel with you. And God used that to bring you, to bring us to repentance and salvation. And God still does this. And he intends to use us, to use you, to continue to build up his church. So let's be faithful to keep making disciples. But to those who choose to continue in their rebellion against God, God being the perfect judge, he will act according to his perfect justice and righteousness. Verse four. Verse four. He who sits in the heavens, that's the Lord, he laughs. The Lord sees the rulers of the earth refusing to submit to his rule, allied together against him, and he doesn't have any reason to fear whatsoever. He sees them all conspiring together to fight against him, and he laughs. The Lord, it says, holds them in derision. Imagine the Lord on his throne seeing this rebellion growing and saying something like, can you believe this? I don't think he would say it that way, but you understand? Can you believe this? Why do these, who do they think they are? How is this even going through their mind? Except God knows exactly who they think they are. He knows exactly what's going through their mind and his judgment will be entirely appropriate. Appropriate. And we have to remember in that, sometimes we might read through the Bible and we see things of God's judgment and we think, oh my goodness. And well, that wouldn't be acceptable. According to whom? That's not our call. It's not our call. God is the one who is in charge and he is good and he is right, everything he does is good and right. 
So, so his thinking does not need to be recalibrated. If anybody's does, it's, it's people, right? Verse four. Nope, we already did that. Verse five. It says, then he will, future tense, he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. This is Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. How amazing. The Lord speaks in his anger against this combined force, the combined forces assembled against him, and his voice, you could say even just his voice, and then with that his words terrifies them, terrifies them. They were so sure of themselves, so ready to take on their almighty creator, and they simply hear his voice, the voice of their rightful king and lord, and they're stopped in their tracks. They're terrified. And while they certainly would have preferred to set themselves on the throne over all the world, which was the point, instead the Lord makes it clear, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And I can't help but imagine an additional thought here, as if the Lord would continue to say, and there's absolutely nothing you could ever do to stop me. Because that would be true, wouldn't it? Understand this as well. And there, there could be a question as to who David, when he's writing Psalm 2, who he's thinking about here. Remember, David was the king, and he was anointed as the king of Israel. And so remember that word in the Hebrew, anointed, is the word we get Messiah from. And so in that way, David was a mini Messiah, right? Given the Hebrew word there, God's anointed king for a time. He was the beginning of this dynastic line. Solomon would come after him and build the temple, but David knew the promise from 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant. Uh, He knew that there was going to be one who would come from his line who would sit on the throne forever. And this one, that one, would be the Messiah, capital M, the promised one, the one to whom the whole of the law of the Lord points to Jesus Christ. And so David writes these verses in the future tense. I think he knew this was a promise for the future. And we, where we are, because we're on the other side of uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Messiah who has come and is coming again, we know exactly who this is. We know exactly who this is. And what we just read this morning from Acts 4 tells us who it is. It's Jesus. In verse 7, the Messiah speaks, He says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord, God the Father, said to me, the Messiah, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. God the Father says to God the Son, you are my son. Uh, Listen to Psalm 89. Psalm 89, verses 26 and 27. It says, he shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation, and I will make him the firstborn, which is a figure of speech uh, or an idiom. It means preeminent. Uh, the first, the one in charge, the highest authority, the highest of the kings of the earth. Uh, notes from the Net Study Bible say this. This idiom, uh, you are my son, it reflects ancient Near Eastern adoption language associated with the covenants of grant by which a lord would reward a faithful subject by elevating him to special status, uh, referred to as sonship. That's what they called it. Like a son, the faithful subject received an inheritance uh, viewed as an unconditional, eternal gift. And such gifts usually took the form of land and or an enduring dynasty. So these people in this time, the writer of this psalm, the original hearers and readers of this psalm, have that practice in their mind as the way things are done around them. Uh, So that would mean the begotten language, that word, that language is not the moment of birth, but we, we know this Christ, he was born in the flesh, right? But Jesus, God the Son, is eternal. So Jesus didn't begin to exist. He took on flesh. 
So begotten is not the moment that Jesus began to exist because he never began to exist. Instead, what it means then is that it's the moment where the inheritance is officially granted. So, when Jesus finally and officially takes the throne, God will inaugurate him or give him his coronation and grant to him in all the world all authority to rule and reign. Uh, The kingdom of the world will be his to rule and everyone in it will be his subject. And so, God says to his anointed in verses eight and nine, God says, ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The nations means all of it, all of it. Every nation, every piece of land there is to have, to own as a possession, will be given to the anointed one, to the Messiah, the king. As it says in Romans eleven thirty six, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. There's a pretty amazing arc here too to the grand narrative of scripture that we see. Uh, think about Adam. Adam, the first man, who in Luke 3, 38 is called little ass, the son of God. And that genealogy in Luke 3 where we see all the way from Jesus all the way back to Adam, the son of God, it says. Uh, But Adam, who functioned as a little s, son of God, was told in the garden to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill and have dominion, uh, to subdue the earth, and he failed. He failed. He sinned, and he was expelled from the garden. Then there was Israel, of whom God called in Exodus 4.22, speaking to Egypt, God called Israel my firstborn son, little s, little s son. And Israel was told to be fruitful and multiply, to expand the borders of the land, and what did they do? They sinned, and eventually they were expelled from the land, the Babylonian exile. But then came Jesus the Messiah, the capital S, son, the second Adam, the true vine. And God the Father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus has never and will never fail. Therefore, he will receive possession of the whole earth and then exercise dominion perfectly. And part of that dominion will be to judge. Christ will be given authority to judge the wicked in a fashion that could be compared to, it says in this verse, taking a rod of iron and smashing a bunch of clay pots to bits and pieces. Very descriptive. Now think about this. The wicked who conspire to rebel against the king, they stand as much chance against him as a clay pot stands against a rod of iron. They will be dashed to pieces. Uh, Imagine the judgment that this passage is talking about is that of Jesus taking a rod of iron and striking, I've got like a baseball swinger because it's my reference, striking the potter's vessels and destroying them with ease. But what if we were to imagine back from the beginning of this psalm Those kings and rulers, they're trying to attack Jesus. What would that be like? Because this verse later on is the idea of Jesus bringing about judgment, but what was happening in the beginning of this psalm? What happens, think about this, what happens when you throw a clay pot against a rod of iron? Does that change anything? Does the fact that the force comes from the clay pot From the clay to the iron, does that change the results? The answer, of course, is no. No. Can you imagine if there were kids playing around in the backyard? Of course, they found a baseball bat and maybe some clay pigeons, which they should not do. That'd be a bad idea. But, you know, clay pigeons like the things they say, pull, and they go, and they shoot it, and it busts in the air and all that stuff. Don't do that, children. But imagine. And they decided to toss them in the air themselves and swing away. Those pieces of clay... They would burst and shoot out and they'd go everywhere, right? Might go pretty far. Uh, What if they just, though, put the bat on the ground 
and they took those clay pigeons and threw them as hard as they could straight down onto the bat, what would still happen to the clay? Right? It would happen either way. The bat's going to win every time. A clay is never going to be iron, no matter how hard you throw it. And so then, how futile are the world's efforts to try and attack the Lord? Christians, I'm saying this, I, I hope you're encouraged by this. Sometimes it feels overwhelming, the attacks, the rejection, the rebellion, the arguments, the yelling. And, and, and organizationally, administratively, structurally, how futile are the world's efforts to try to attack the Lord? For 2,000 years since Christ ascended to heaven and since the birth of the church, Satan and the world have been working to thwart God's plan, seeking to put a stop to Christ's mission to build the church, fighting against his coming rule and reign, persecuting the church, putting stumbling blocks before the church, shaking their fists at God, rejecting and rebelling against him. And for 2,000 years, plus however long it'll be before Jesus comes again, all they're going to be doing is throwing clay pots at a rod of iron or throwing chaff into the wind, expecting the chaff to somehow break, stop the wind from blowing. Can you imagine that? If you saw somebody who was picking up chaff out in the field and throwing it as hard as they could into the wind, and the wind would just, they go, ah, I failed again. Well, duh. Right? That's the visualization. That's the chance the world has. They'll fail every time. Christ wins. It's futile. They'll lose every time. Christ has overcome the world. Jesus is our champion. Be encouraged in that as well. It's not because we're so awesome. Jesus is our champion. He is and forever will be undefeated. The louder the world yells, the greater pressure they put on the church to cave to their will. All they're doing is throwing clay pots at a rod rod of iron. All they're doing is throwing chaff into the wind. They lose every time. And one day, it says here, Christ will pick that rod of iron up and finish the matter, dashing them in pieces. With that being said, what should the rulers of this world and really everyone else too, what should we do about that? Verse 10. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. (laughs) Take what you've just heard and process it. Chew on that for a little bit. Choose your next actions carefully. Apply wisdom to what you've just been told and do this. Verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Uh, The word for rejoice could have also been translated in the Hebrew here as repent. Serve the Lord with fear and repent with trembling. In the context, it sort of makes sense that it would be repent, uh, but even choosing to rejoice in the Lord serving him would be an evidence of repentance, so either way it works fine. No worries. The same conclusion comes true. And then verse 12 And this would be the ultimate sign of repentance, the act that all other repentance would flow from. Verse 12, kiss the son, meaning pay homage to the son. Kiss his feet. Commit to him your loyalty, your allegiance. We could say it this way, give your allegiance to the anointed. And then it says, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. And the contrast, blessed are all who take refuge in him. There's five commands in verses 10 through 12. Five commands. And the first two refer to our thinking from verse 10. Be wise. Be warned. Be wise, kings. Be warned, rulers of the earth. 
And then the next three commands refer to our actions. Remember, we see this over and over in the Bible. We do what we do because we want what we want. We want what we want because we think what we think. And that's why repentance, we define that as a change of actions resulting from a change of thinking. So there's a change of thinking here that's going to result in, in the end in a change of actions. And these actions start in verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and trembling. Rejoice or repent with trembling. And then third, pay homage to the Son. Kiss the Son. So what, what's the big idea here? If we will wise up to the truth of who Jesus is and who we really are, who God created us to be, if a person will wise up to the truth and be warned of what is coming as he or she continues throwing clay pots against a rod of iron, thinking they're making a difference and getting the upper hand, if they will truly wise up and be warned, what else would they do but repent, turn, and pay homage to their rightful master and king, and thereafter serve him with all reverence? Does that make sense? That's the only right conclusion. And with that, the world and every one of us is left with those two choices, these two choices. Number one, you can continue to believe the lie that God isn't who the Bible says he is and keep throwing your clay pots against a rod of iron as hard as you like. You can, not realizing that rod of iron will soon dash you to pieces. That's, that's heavy, isn't it? Uh, but it's what the word of God says. You can choose to continue to believe the Bible is just a book of all the things that an unfair God doesn't let you do, which would be a terrible over and incorrect simplification of the Bible. You can choose to believe that or, or remaining in ignorance, willfully not knowing what the word of God says, you can even choose to believe that God is not like what people say that he says from the Bible and make him instead exactly like you want him to be, which ironically often ends up being a lot like me, whoever the person is. When we get to redefine who God is, God ends up looking a lot like me. You can choose to try to do that. You can choose to believe all the commandments from Scripture are just the invention of religious oppressors, if you want to. Hear this, understand, we don't have any desire to oppress anyone. We are sinners forgiven by the grace of God, trying to help other sinners find and enjoy and be saved by Jesus Christ. But in all these things, we can choose to believe these wrong beliefs, and in doing so, the one who chooses that path also chooses to remain dead in their trespasses and sins. You can remain in your condemnation. John 3, 18, whoever does not believe in him is condemned already. You can choose to take these positions or any others like it, but if you do, be warned for those who reject him. When the day of judgment comes, his wrath is kindled quickly. Option two. There's our second option, to take refuge in the Son. Take refuge in the Son. The truth is, we all deserve the wrath of God. None of us could escape his all-knowing righteous judgment, but God. He commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, willingly went to the cross and died a sinner's death he didn't deserve to die. And there at the cross, God's wrath that we deserve was poured out on him, on Jesus, Christ being our substitute. Imagine the, the Messiah who Psalm 2 says will take a rod of iron and dash the clay to pieces is the same Messiah who came and took on flesh and died to pay the penalty of our sin. He became the one dashed in pieces for us. 
That's the love and grace of God. And so we are to take refuge in him. We are protected, we are shielded, and then pardoned in him. And then even more than that, declared righteous. Christ's righteousness is put to our account. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Psalm 34, 22, The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. So friends, if you're here today and you have never truly bowed the knee, if you have never agreed with God that you are a sinner, that you deserve his righteous judgment, but that you believe uh, that he sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay for your sin, if you've never asked him for forgiveness and salvation, will you? Will you do that today? Will you repent and turn to him and become a follower of Jesus today? God promised us in his word, if you will confess with your mouth that Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Put your faith in Christ. Pay homage to the Son and be saved today. And then Christians, let's give our all for him. God has been merciful and gracious. God has loved us. He has given us Christ to be our sacrifice, our substitute, our refuge. He will never fail. He has given us eternal inheritance, uh, eternal life. He has given us an eternal purpose, not one that we'll eventually see, but one that can start now, an eternal purpose. Uh, Ephesians 2, for by God's grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's a gift from God, not a result of works that no one may boast. For we are... Now we go from here, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So church, let's walk together in love and adoration in the works God has prepared for us to do, knowing that when we follow hard after Christ, our joy will be full. And and as the early Christians and apostles did in Acts 4, Let's pray for and proceed with boldness. With boldness. Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against him. Let's go tell the world and entrust the results to our anointed, conquering king. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage of scripture. It can be so challenging, hard to talk about, to think about uh, your righteous judgment, to think about punishment, to think about hell. And it feels so awkward sometimes to think that any of us might say anything to anybody else about the prospect of something like that. God, I pray that you would give us a greater fear of you than we have of men. That we would have a right humility knowing that we never speak of the condemnation of God as people who have arrived. That God isn't up in heaven just with his with your jaw dropped to the floor amazed by how amazing we are but that you see us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that we are sinners saved by grace and humbled Uh, you have called us to be and commanded us to be now uh, by what 2 Corinthians 5 says ministers of reconciliation so Lord we thank you for your mercy We thank you for the grace that you have given to us through Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can be here today and know that you are wonderful, that you are glorious, that you are good and kind and merciful and gracious, that we have forgiveness and rescue and eternal life in Jesus Christ, uh, that we would not be so full of ourselves to think that there's any other reason why we're standing here, sitting here, worshiping you, enjoying this time together today that you would get all the glory and praise as you so rightly deserve. And then with that heart, with that heart of humility, we would step forward in joy, 
in gratitude, in humility, and plead with others, even with tears, that they would turn from their sin, turn from their rebellion against you to serve the living God, to rest in the sacrifice, the forgiveness, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So God, we thank you for this reminder today. Use us to bring you more glory. And I pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.